One of the worst arguments for young earth creationism is easily the argument of genetic entropy. It's at least as bad as the classic, if we evolved from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys? Though thankfully that last one has largely been disowned by the creationist community. I still find it nails on a chalkboard annoying, and unfortunately it's everywhere. It's peddled by evangelist organizations like Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis to, you know, reputable organizations like PragerU. We should celebrate CO2 as the giver of life that it is. Okay, not reputable, but professional looking. Two of the biggest problems with this argument are the constant comparisons to man-made spoken and coding languages and the arbitrary nature of the term information. With regards to the first problem, this is just a terrible analogy. According to PragerU, Bill Gates has said DNA is like a software program. I don't know if he said this, and frankly I don't really care enough to look it up. Bill Gates isn't a geneticist. If anything, he has a bias towards looking at it like a computer program. In man-made languages, letters and symbols have very specific connotations and meanings. For example, when if statements aren't followed by then statements, it breaks the logic of a program. A quote-unquote mutation would damage the functionality and meaning of this system. And the same is true for spoken languages. Let's take the example, I have a sentence. Exchanging a single character affects the sentence's meaning, but it's still mostly legible. And as these changes accumulate, the sentence becomes less and less so. Now, creationists posit that, like in spoken languages, meaning is lost in DNA as the number of mutations accumulates. This is simply not true. Unlike these man-made languages, the genetic code is redundant. This means that multiple codons will output the same type of amino acid. Therefore, a lot of substitutions have no effect on the genome. Despite the redundancy, amino acids are still occasionally exchanged. Unlike in programming languages, switching out amino acids does not halt the code, or in this case, the peptide chain. The ribosomes chug along until they encounter a stop codon. Changing a single amino acid usually has very little effect on the protein structure, only being noticeable when you know a secondary or tertiary structure is broken, like if a proline was inserted into an alpha helix, or if a cysteine was replaced removing a disulfide bond. Usually, base substitutions are only very detrimental if they interfere with the promoter sequence or create or remove a stop codon. Therefore, mutations usually alter function very little, though this has notable exceptions such as like sickle cell anemia. The most damaging types of mutations are usually frameshift mutations. Often, when they occur in functional regions of the DNA, they're very harmful. Luckily, large regions of our genome do not have sequence-dependent functionality. A 2017 study suggests that the upper cap on regions with sequence dependence cannot exceed 15% of our genome. And if our genome was entirely sequence dependent, couples would need to have, on average, 136 to 230 sextillion children to maintain a stable population. Of course, they're both unreasonable numbers, but that last one is an insane number. To put it into perspective, it's about 30 factors higher than the upper bound of stars within our cosmic horizon. Of course, it's under an extremely high deleterious mutation fraction of about 76%, and the highest observed mutation rate that the study used. But as I said, both are absurd, and the lowest and the highest deleterious mutation rates are both theoretically possible. If PragerU wants to talk about probability, <laughs> I will easily match them. In the rare cases where mutations affect the sequence-dependent regions in a non-neutral way, natural selection does a pretty great job of weeding out the mutations that decrease overall fitness, while allowing beneficial mutations to quickly propagate. Creationists claim that if selection pressures aren't strong enough, slightly harmful mutations will eventually add up. Which is true! This is a large part of why we see so many age-related diseases. Essentially, once you're past reproductive capability, Mother Nature stops caring. In reproductive populations, the selective pressures are much stronger, so it's rare for deleterious mutations to accumulate, with most models only having them aggregate if coupled to beneficial mutations that outweigh the separate negative mutation, or in populations absent of foreign admixtures, such as Mueller's ratchet and asexual populations or inbreeding and sexual ones, in which case offspring inherit and add on to the full genetic load of their parent or parents. And in these models, the population eventually dies out. Outside of these isolated systems, the real world prevents these accumulations by recombination and interspersed periods of more intense selective pressures. My second biggest problem with the idea of genetic entropy is claiming that information can only be lost without ever defining what information means in this context. 
Like the word kinds in the creationist dictionary, information is a vapid term that can never be given a meaning because once it's actually defined, exceptions will be demonstrated. As a commonly cited example, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA for short, contains a gene known as MECA, which encodes for a transpeptidase that prevents many antibiotics from breaking the cell walls and ultimately lysing the cells. This doesn't count as a beneficial mutation because horizontal gene transfer doesn't count as an evolutionary mechanism for some reason, and because this new protein decreases fitness in the absence of antibiotics. In other words, it decreases fitness in an environment that the organism is no longer adapted to, in a similar vein to how an arctic fox would have a tough time living in a rainforest. Incredible deduction there. That's why, when they do define it, it usually has something to do with the development of entirely novel proteins arising. Unfortunately for young earthers, we have examples of this happening too. In humans, for instance, our color vision is typically trichromatic. It's controlled by cone cells which contain photopigments. There are three different types of photopigment, called opsins, corresponding to three different wavelength peaks. Medium wave and long wave opsins are controlled by remarkably similar genes. Both genes are located on the X chromosome and have the same number of exons and introns, as well as very similar specific sequences being shared between them. Interestingly, these two genes are only shared between humans and other old world monkeys. Many scientists think that an unequal crossing over event of the X chromosome duplicated the medium wave opsin. Then, the gene underwent three base substitution mutations in exon 5 that allowed this new copy to see at a lower frequency spectrum. Other scientists think that the duplication event occurred after two homologous genes were formed, and that they were acting as separate alleles on the same locus. Whichever hypothesis you choose, this is a pretty solid example of a beneficial mutation. And if you don't believe this could happen in the real world, we've seen something very similar happen in the howler monkeys of the genus Aulata, the only trichromatic New World monkeys. I can already hear people whining that, despite overwhelming statistical probability, we didn't witness these mutations take place. And although semantics, I'd argue that we did, or at least our super great ancestors did about 40 million years ago, <laughs> joking aside, we have witnessed a very similar event happen in a lab. Dr. Richard Linsky began the long-term evolutionary experiment in February of 1988, in which he maintained 12 lines of E. coli and subjected them to the exact same evolutionary pressures each day. If you're curious about the exact conditions, I'll link them in the description. The only one important to my point is the growth medium of DM25, which contains a low concentration of glucose and large amounts of citrate. After a pretty fast bump in the population growth and evolutionary rate at the start of the experiment, the daily growth mostly plateaued as the organisms became more well adapted to their environment. Then, one of the cultures had a population explosion overnight. Once contamination was ruled out, the researchers dove into the genes of these E. coli, discovering that this line and only this line had evolved to metabolize citrate in aerobic environments, despite this being a characteristic not found in other E. coli strains. Using cells sampled from earlier benchmark generations, Dr. Zachary Blount discovered that the cells underwent a duplication event of the gene that normally codes for a protein that allows citrate to be taken into the cell. This protein is usually only expressed in anaerobic environments, but this duplicate copy hitched a ride to the promoter of an adjacent gene, allowing E. coli to ferment citrate despite the presence of aerobic conditions. If your objection to this is, it's still a bacteria, as if bacteria is a single created kind, then we're getting somewhere. If you've made it this far in a conversation, the creationists are likely claiming that none of these examples count because they only demonstrate exaptation and duplications of previous proteins. This would be a problem if the theory of evolution was claiming that novel proteins developed out of thin air. That's why it doesn't. Every evolutionary change relies on previously existing structures, with the changes rooted in something as basic as transcription to something as complex as splicing. The only exception to this rule is the origin of life, which is a completely different conversation from evolution, and one I don't particularly plan on covering, because I don't think it's something we can ever know for certain, nor is it particularly relevant to evolution. Common descent and the theory of evolution start once we have the earliest cells, and we have a pretty good understanding of what comes after that. If I haven't shown enough why genetic entropy is objectively a bad argument, it even creates problems within the young earth worldview, which is why you have so much disagreement within YEC circles. Some are set on the idea that mutations are only ever harmful and must lead to the breakdown of the genome by way of genetic entropy while others argue that there must be beneficial mutations. I definitely agree with the latter, although it creates other problems, such as arbitrarily drawing lines of how far speciation can go, but that's not the point of this video. If all animal kinds are descended from a population size of two on the Ark, and no mutation can ever be beneficial, then you physically cannot explain the diversity of life. 
This would mean that you have a maximum of four alleles for any specific gene, and evolution can only occur when one breaks. But what happens when you have more than four alleles for a protein, all of which are equally valid with different expressed phenotypes? Is one for some reason a degenerate of another? If so, why? In essence, this is just a bad argument disguised by the fact that the word genetics is for some reason a buzzword surrounded by mysticism. The only way that they make this argument sound reasonable is by drowning you in analogies that simply don't work, or relying on the vagueness of the word information and the fact that most people, especially their audiences, don't understand gene expression. Now, I'm not going to say that there's necessarily good arguments for young earth creationism, but there's definitely more compelling arguments than this. Please stop using it. It just doesn't work and it hurts my soul every time I hear it. Okay, you can go now. The uh, the informational scripted bit of the video is over. I just wanted to ramble a bit on my ideas for the future of this channel. Um, starting with, if you thought this was interesting or informative, <laughs> or at the very least entertaining, please let me know. Um, I'm not entirely sold on the whole YouTube thing, so if I get a fairly positive response, I'll definitely make more. Um, going forward, I think I want to take it more in the route of history of life and evolutionary and or evolution and phylogeny, etc. Um, just because I, I'm i interested in that. I have a video on Confucius Ornus lined up, and that should be pretty good. Um, but I just wanted to start with this because, you know, it's a, it's a pretty low-hanging fruit to get me started. Um, I'm pretty sure that's it. Thank you for watching.